My guest this morning is Christo Spies, the school chaplain for St. Michael's School for Girls in Bloemfontein. Christo is also a mental coach for a number of sports teams and sports individuals in South Africa. Morning, Christo. Hi, Jacob. Values play a huge part in your life. Tell us about it. You know, the famous psychologist William James said the most important discovery in his lifetime was that people by and large become what they think about themselves. You know, and that's quite significant if you think that our value system form part of our belief system. So, and um, I found that athletes and, and learners, etc., live up to their beliefs. So, uh, they be what they believe about themselves. So, if, if you believe that you can't do so something, you will live up to that. Mm -hmm. So, we need to look at the belief system of people. We need to look at the, the va what values play, uh, how the values play, um, what role the values play in, that, in the belief system. Because that determines what you do from what you believe about yourself, but it also determines your future because uh, you set your goals, etc., according to your belief system. And of which values is, uh, plays a big uh, part. One of your roles as, as a school chaplain in a girls' school is to instill the values in the school system. What do you do at the school on a very practical level? You know, it's very basic. Um, we instill values by, from grade one. And one of the ways that we do that is we talk about the family of St. Michael's School. So whenever someone is attached to the school in any way, they, they form part of the family. So it's immediately the family value comes in, the family care, etc. So it's the, we talk about the family of St. Michael's whenever, wherever we, uh, we go. And the girls refer to each other as sisters. So when we say, you know, the, your older sisters or your younger sisters, so th there's a care system that, that's sort of like family orientated and that's a more enclosed system. Then we, um, we also have a mentoring system where the girls care for one another. In other words, um, for, for example, the teachers um, get allocated a, a number of five or six girls to mentor. And it's not just a group of matrics or a group of grade 11s. What we do if it's for senior school girls, then it's a grade 8, grade 9, grade 10, 11 and a grade 12 girl. So, and they meet once every two weeks, etc. They do individual mentoring, but also in a in a group. So um, these in this system, when the matrix sit, when they sit in this little group, and they, and she says she struggled with this, or she's struggling with this, and she sort of started learning earlier, and uh, then the grade eights hear this. And it sort of motivates them and it guides them through that process for the matric. Or if the grade eight says she's struggling with this and the orientation or whatever stuff, then the matric says no. But we've been through that, and we, you see, so it's a, it's not just a mentoring from the teacher. The teacher sort of facilitates this. So and that instills a lot of of the values of the school that we would like. We also speak into their lives what we would like them to be. Um, from grade one, we call them ladies. We don't talk about girls. We don't talk about um, little brats or whatever they, they get called. We talk about ladies. So whenever we address them, we say, good morning, ladies, good morning. So we speak into their lives what we would like them to become. And it's always, in, always interesting if we have guest speakers or so on and we address them as ladies a number of guys came up and said, but they're not ladies. How can you call them ladies? You know, the, they must first prove that they are ladies. And we say, no, we speak it into their lives because if, if they hear from grade one, I'm a lady, they live up to that normally. And then they start acting as ladies in class. They start acting they, wherever they go because that's who they are. It's not just what they do. Mm. And they start believing, I'm a lady. And you get, they get addressed as ladies and they get treated as ladies. And, and eventually they, they end up as the, with the deportment and the behavior uh, um, true to a lady. You frequently speak on public occasions and address school principals and teachers. And on a number of occasions, you made the remark that we constantly tell our learners in our schools what they should not do. 
instead of teaching them what they should do. Explain that to us. Yeah, you see, that's a huge part of my role as a mental coach with athletes because we normally know what we shouldn't do or must not do. And as adults and teachers, <laughs> that's what we learn. That's how we deal with our children. So we tell them, don't do this. Don't make a mess. Don't miss the ball. So, and the picture that you create, that's what eventually pulls you through in the moment that you, that you don't think clearly. So, uh, and if I say to you, don't think of an elephant, that's where your mind goes because I create the picture. So we need to start saying what we want. And I've seen that in classes where, they, where the teachers say, don't make such a noise or just make a statement of, by saying, uh, you're the noisiest class we've e ever had. They live up to that. Because they get in the next class and then the, then the teachers say, oh, come on guys, keep quiet. Then they say, ah, oh, they already told us we're the noisiest class ever. And so they live up to that. Not because they were the noisiest class, because it's been instilled in them, a sort of an, uh, um, the picture. And the same with the learners. We tell them what not to do. And if you just convert that to what you want, you create a different picture. Because if I, instead of saying, don't drop the ball, that ha a lot of things happen. Your eyes drop, your hands drop if, you, if you're playing. But if I say to you, catch the next ball, it's a completely different picture. And so many times it takes you away from what was wrong in the past, which, is, which you can't change anything about, to what, what you can do in the future. And anything is possible. Mm. Anything. Uh, the future is never equal to the, uh, to, uh, to the past. We create our own future. So if someone couldn't do something, you, uh, you, of course they can do it in the future. But then you need to take their minds and everything to give them a better chance of doing it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, it's the same with the value part, that we need to, when someone doesn't do it, whatever, doesn't, that's not who they, who they are, it's what they do. And we need to distinguish between the two. We need to focus on who people are and who we want them to be instead of what they do. Mm -hmm. Because we point out what they do and you are pathetic or you are useless. or um, We call them names. That's not who they are. If they, if they did something wrong, they, that's what they did. But if, if a guy is sloppy, that's not who he is. That's what he did. So we need to distinguish, and I think that's where the value system comes in. If we get the learners and teachers to realize that's the part that we need to work on, who they are, and then we, you deal with the stuff they do a lot easier. And that's what I do with teams. And one, some of the crucial uh, parts, I've just been down to the Natal Dolphins, and one of the things that we're busy working on, who are we? What do we stand for? What do we do? Because once you sorted that out, the relationships look after itself. Because, because the, um, the moment you, you, I know what we stand for, then if I'm out of line, then it's not a personal thing. If you're out of line, then if I, if I say, come on, you know, you're out of line, then it's not a personal thing. Because that's what we stand for. That's who we are. Mm -hmm. And then it's easier to see when you go offline and bring back instead of just, you know, it's personal, they picking on me, etc. Mm -hmm. So a big part, I th believe, of, of instilling values uh, um, is through, the, uh, through knowing, working on who people are, what, who I am, who the, what the schools stand for, what the, the learners, etc. And as family, what do we stand for? Mm -hmm. Who are we? Yeah. Leadership. And the quality of leaders and the constant equipment of your, of your staff members is, is vital when you talk about the responsibility of the educators and how they should, should uh, convey the message and to be a positive role model. What do you do at your school to, to equip your leaders, number one, and to motivate your staff members? John Maxwell said, hope in the future brings you power in the present. So I think big part of it, of what I do with teachers, uh, is to in, try to instill hope. And they can only do it themselves. But there's a process. And, and if you want 
to, uh, to have hope for the future. And I really believe that's the problem in South Africa. People don't have hope for the future. Therefore, they feel powerless now. They don't want to attempt stuff. They don't know whether it's worthwhile learning, whether it's worthwhile even preparing to teach because they, they just go through the motions. And a big part of that is because they don't have hope for the future. And to create hope for the future, you just have to have something that you to look forward to, to know where you're going, know what you want to do. The moment you know what you want to do and where you go, Going, that's the first step of hope. And the second step is to think clearly when you hit an obstacle, when there's something in your way, to how to deal with it. Now, that's, that's how I think we should deal with teachers because they come into schools with a love and a, for, for learners and a love for children and a love for teaching. And suddenly, with all the pressures from the department and the facilitators and the school board and from the parents, they, they don't like teaching. And they don't look forward to, and I always challenge them. And, and what happens is when, they don't, when they, uh, they don't like what they do, they don't prepare properly. And then it's easy, and they think they can get away in class by just waffling and talking, and that's when they start picking on the children and tell them to shut up, etc. But when they prepare properly and they engage the children in a, in a decent way, Suddenly, it's the teaching process. Suddenly, they deal with that one person that disrupts the class a lot better because the, there's 29 others that, that sits there, that did their homework, etc. Suddenly, their focus shift. So, and that's part of the mental toughness part. But if they know what they want, where they're going, and why they're teaching this, and they, and they rekindle the love they have for the subject and for teaching, suddenly they prepare on a different level. And when they prepare, they, they come and they teach. They come in, in, in the class with a plan of what to do. And if there's a problem, they find out how to deal with the problem. And suddenly they start like, uh, just to like teaching or love teaching again, and it takes them to the new uh, level. And it, it, they have different children because they start teaching and they engage the children. And when the children, are, uh, the, they encourage the teach, uh, children to ask questions because it, um, it's part of the preparation. But if they don't, haven't prepared, then they, they may just give them work and they must work and not ask, etc. So we try to equip the, the teachers to create hope for themselves by, and we do that through regular sessions, help them to deal with, give them certain tools for mental toughness. So I take them through like a, it's not a cold sitting workshop, but to help them to say, okay, this is what I would like, mm. but then to break it down to the process, not just I want a better relationship with my learners, to say, okay, what's your game plan for that? And when you get a game plan to do this and this and this and this, it's not just one thing and it's not just dependent on you. Mm. And because there's more people involved. And then we take them down. What's the processes that we can follow? Mm. And there, that's where the teachers help each other. Mm. And that's a... a, a it's wonderful. That's where team building, etc., comes in because they and they they help each other and you know because the moment that you work together, you lift everyone. Um, you lift the, te the the learners. You lift all this teaching staff, and there's a bond uh, that takes place. Sort of that that makes it worthwhile just to get in the staff room during break. Mm. Let's talk about experience from the learner side. They're still learners, so I presume rules will stay will still yeah. play an important part in the school. Um, but what's the culture like in your school uh, when you start before the, before you've started with the values program and the family program? And what's the climate and atmosphere at the school now? You see, it's been the almost forever ever seeing that the um, that we have a chapel service every morning. It makes it a lot easier. So we, we can, in, at our school, relate it more to the body of Christ that we just carry over to the body of St. Michael's, uh, St. Michael's family. So the, the family of Christ, we sort of connect that and it makes it a little easier. So um, the founding sisters of the school actually s sort of started that. So we just build on that. So it's a little easier for us. But um, one of the things that we stress very seriously is that, th that the teachers treat the girls as lay. But, and that means no compromise in terms of the rules. Because, and it's easier to say, you know, um, we, ladies don't arrive late. Ladies don't scream at each other. Mm. 
that's ladylike behavior. So we go back to the value and not, hey, you can't scream, man. It's not, good, you know, it's not good manners. And, and we go on a, a personal level. So that's why the value system at the school and in the family or wherever is so important because then it's easier to say, hey, th that's not the way ladies act. And they know the way ladies act, so it's, it's easier to come in line, get them in line, and we don't compromise on the rules, but in a little different. It's not looking what they did wrong. It's just to show them that's not the way that ladies act, for one example. This is the way that it's done. And it's a lot easier to bring. There's no confrontation. I don't need to shout or whatever. I just need to say, oh, come on, guys. Um, um, that's not the way we do it at this school. That's not the, how we care for family mm. uh, or whatever. So, and uh, one of the things that I stress with the teachers and try to get to the parents, we, we struggle with the parents a little because I found that parents are very involved when the children are very young. But the older they get, they disappear. And I think part of it comes from the children. They don't want their parents around and they don't want to be embarrassed. You know, in our, our school we have people that are not so fluent in Afrikaans or English. So the, the learners that, are, that can speak the language well are sometimes ashamed of their parents. Mm -hmm. They're not educated, they're, they're not sophisticated the way the, uh, these learners sort of go, grow beyond that, which is a problem in the senior school, the involvement of parents. But we try to instill with the, with the learners and the teachers the example that they set. They need to walk the talk. You know, and I, th I really believe the big part why children go off the rail is, the ex is because of the hypocrisy of the, the adults. They say, uh, do what I say, don't do what I do. Mm -hmm. So I, I smoke and you just, you don't, you're not allowed to smoke, but I smoke. So, so the idea that the, the learners get even subconsciously is, okay, I'm not allowed to smoke now, but as soon as I, I leave school, I can do it because mm -hmm. all adults do it. So they, the adults say one thing and do another. And adults, and especially te teachers, need to talk, uh, walk the talk. Mm -hmm. If they say, be on time, they need to be on time. Mm -hmm. So they, they're part of this value system and the family system as well. Mm -hmm. So, and the care system. Um, so we try to do it with them. I try to care for them the way that I want to, them to, to, to care for their children. So that's the first thing, the, the values that we, in, or, or the, to walk the talk, to be genuine. The second part is, is to, uh, um, to be there. You know, um, James Dobson tells a, a, a wonderful story. He says he dri he's driving, he's, uh, his daughter is in the car with him, so they just drive along and they chit-chat and suddenly they drive past this triple X movies in the States mm. uh, where they show pornographic movies and he says, his daughter said to him, you know, Daddy, that's a, that's a, bad, that's a bad place. That's a bad, bad movies they show there, isn't it? And he said, yes. She said it's about uh, they exploiting women and it's about sexual with, uh, outside marriage, etc. And she named a couple of facts and every time he just said, yes, my girl. And they drove on. He said that, no, that evening he thought, what if she went past there with her friends? And she didn't have me to talk to at one stage and to bounce it off me. Because if she said, you know, what is, what's going on in there? And, that, and maybe someone said, no, let's go and try. Maybe it's not so bad, et cetera. Where would you go? Mm -hmm. So you need to be there for, for the learners. So that's, that's the next step. And then the, and then the last the, or the third one is to, I think, to look what you put into their minds. Um, you, know, uh, you know, the younger we start, the better. Because the, um, there's lots of, of research showing that it's much easier for a child under five to learn a language, for instance, than it's for an adult. So the younger we start instilling the values, uh, the better. It's also a biblical principle. I think it's Proverbs 22.6 where it says, um, if you show a person the way early on, when he's older, he won't go uh, off, the, off that way because it's, it's something that's instilled deep inside of him. So we need to, the younger we start, and we need to, to, to instill the right values because I see a, a parents put their children in front of the TV just to keep them busy. So who's instilling values? 
what are they instilling? Oh, get them out with a nanny. You get wonderful nannies, but are those the values that you want to instill? And sometimes it's uneducated values, even though uh, or uneducated people or people like students or stuff. And if that's the only values that, that gets instilled into your child, uh, you've got a couple of problems. So we need to be there to instill values in them and, and create them to use or help them to use their creative brains, etc. Let them rather play or spend time with them to just like James Hobson, just saying, yes, my girl, to affirm what she, because there's been values instilled in her before and now you just, now she's a teenager just to, to affirm those values. And uh, so um, I think as adults, we have a huge role to play. Let's talk about this mentor program in the school. How do you equip your learners to be mentors? And how do you equip your senior learners to facilitate discussions in, in the classrooms? I think, you know, I think uh, that's something that comes naturally if we allow people to do it. Um, because that's how... Uh, People, we call it mentor and we think we need all this training. I, don't th I think we make it more complicated than it is. Because in a, in a normally f normal family setup, the elders, if you think an African setup, the elders sit around the fire and they, teach, they tell stories. Mm. Stories instilling values and that's the way our people has done it and that's the way we should do it and this what went wrong and this is what went right so the, the learners learn that then the parents and it gets passed down from the elders to the parents to the children and I think that's a that's what happens in the family as well so if we need to create those opportunities yes, in our school community definitely in a normal family a normal functioning family today the, the father and mother if you just sit and eat together they're instilling values this is the way we do it you say thank you if you if you pass something on uh, you don't eat with your mouth full or, you, or whatever whatever it is that you the way that you do it and that's the way and you model it for for the younger children mm -hmm. so and i think that's that's the easiest way and it's not a complicated way, so the people buy into it very easily. So all the teacher needs to do when she sits with her or he sits, sits with his little group of mentees, then they, he just needs to, to, to say, to, to uh, show care or to show love mm -hmm. or to, if someone goes through a problem, just to show a bit of empathy and, uh, and compassion. And to, to facilitate and try to, to listen or to ask, you know, who have you dealt with it? Like, like uh, the learners, like if a, if a matric girl complains that she's, she's struggling now because she only started working in matric, she should have done that a lot earlier. That's an opportunity, you know, you can sit with a problem all the time and just talk about this problem. But what we encourage them to do and just guide them a little is to say, okay, get this learner to share how she should have done it or how she's going to deal with it now because now she's looking for a solution and she's actually teaching the younger ones that they, you know, start earlier. Look at me, I'm struggling now. This is how I'm going to recover. So she's actually telling them, start a little earlier. That will motivate them to see, so that they don't have to suffer or go through what she's going down. But she's also looking for a solution to say, I'm going to try this. And that's where the teacher comes in and say, you know, that you might try this or this or this. And again, this is a lesson for the younger ones sitting there. And that's why we do it like grade 12, grade 11, grade 10, etc. That it's not just a matric group because when it's a, a normal peer group, they tend to just focus on the problems and <laughs> repeat it. And they, you know, that's not fair. Yeah, yeah, it's not fair. You know, <laughs> too much work and whatever. And now it's different groups and the matrix needs to keep the, the sort of, you know, the, the prestige of uh, our matrix are really a, a cut above the rest of the, they have a special uniform. Uh, they, the moment that they step into that uniform, for the younger children, they're almost like teachers. Mm -hmm. and, they, and it's amazing how you see just that, the, the little bit of prestige that we give to the matrix, make them step us. Uh, up and act as true ladies, even girls that's been sort of shaky, 
suddenly step up when they wear that uniform and they treat it like like a real, they, they, then they step into that role uh, 100%. The moment we create those opportunities yes, exactly. and unlock the potential. For sure. Christo is also available for motivational speeches and workshops at schools. His contact details will appear on the screen. There's also a website where you can purchase his DVD. The DVD is available in Afrikaans and in English.